the choice to come out is a choice. The choice to tell people is a choice. But the, there's no choice about being who you are. It's like、um, saying,、um, you know, if you're a straight person, you choose to be straight. You don't choose to be straight. You don't choose to be queer,、uh, whether that be gay, bi, trans, any, you know, anything along those lines. It's just something that you are innate. But a lot of people who go through Uh, being gay, it's it's quite traumatic because we live in a world which is very different to who our identity is. It, there's this word called heteronormative.、Mm. So we live in a world which, everywhere you look, it's you know a man and a woman couple off, generally speaking. And so when you grow up in that, and then you realise you don't fit into that, but to please your parents or to please society, you may need to fit into that. It creates a lot of dissonance, and that can create a lot of mental anxiety, then mental health problems as well. And you come across this. And therefore, there's a there's this huge challenge in our community. Hey, welcome back to Soul Awakenings with Madia Sosan podcast. And today we have Yatin Mystery. Yatin is a mindset coach and NLP practitioner. He specializes in queer and people of the global majority. Helping them navigate the complexities of culture challenges, shame, and self-doubt through empathic self-communication and reframing negative thinking patterns. As an out, proud, married gay man, he empathizes with the unique challenges our communities can go through. He is accredited with the Association of Coaching and trained with the Academy of Modern Applied Psychology. There's more to this amazing guy. Let's bring him on. Hi, Yatin. How are you doing, bro? Hey, hey, hey. Very good. Very good, Madia. You keeping well? Oh yeah, amazing, amazing. I was thinking、awesome. back. When did we last meet? That was years ago. Years and years ago.、Uh, It has on been the a beach. while. Yeah, and then we became friends, and、yeah. uh, and then we did public speaking together. That's right.、Uh, this, yeah, that was incredible. I helped、experience. you move in. I helped you do some of your furniture. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I moved into my flat in that period, and he's like, "Ah,、oh, I'll help you out." I was like, "Oh, you're so kind." And yeah, you came <laughs> and did my wardrobe, which was quite heavy to do. <laughs> so I really appreciate that.、Um, okay. But yeah, so、um, now tell us about who Yatin is. Who is what? Do you, who is Yatin? What do you do? Overall, brief over overall about yourself. Yeah, sure. So,、um, my name is Yatin Mystery.、Um, so, I'm based in the northwest of England, in Bolton, in Manchester, and I am a, a mindset coach.、Uh, so, I help people overcome self limiting beliefs. I、uh, kind of give clarity to any、uh, thinking that they have, and I specialize within、uh, queer people and the global majority. So, you know, some people refer to that as people of color or、uh, the BAME community, because、uh, that's my background. You know, I'm a gay man Indian, of Indian origins and have successfully navigated that space,、um, married, settled, etc., etc., all of that、um, uh, stuff. So,、um, I. Been through a lot of challenges, as you can imagine, through that process of coming out and, and being myself. So, I wanted to help other people and come to terms with their own sense of self. Now, it doesn't necessarily be about sexuality. We've all we're all struggling in some shape, form, or other. It might be about you know trying to get that job promotion, ask that boy out, ask that girl out. It might be about you know wanting to be a public speaker. So we all have these. Skeletons in our closets, you know these things that we kind of want to be authentically ourselves about. So I help people along that journey and along that path.、Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, so that's kind of what I specialize in. I also do a few other bits and pieces as well. I was originally a Londoner, as you could probably hear from my accent, <laughs> Southerner.、Okay. <laughs> and, yeah.、Um, Quite unique. <laughs> I, yeah, indeed. Yeah.、Um, and then、uh, yeah, so I worked in the corporate lifestyle for a number of years as well. Gave all that up, and then about seven years ago, me and my husband moved up to the northwest,、mm-hmm. and we're now northerners,、uh, or honorary northerners, anyway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you live in、uh, Greater Manchester in Bolton,、mm-hmm. don't you? That's yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Amazing. Um. So, like, obviously, we're going to talk about quite a lot of stuff. But when I met、mm. you at the beach, it was just an incredible experience because I've、wow. never come across gay man who's Asian. Right, and well, up until now, and then after you, I was like, I found more, more, you know,、yeah. more、uh, come across more people. So, 
it was quite interesting because all we know is in our culture, we if you come out gay, you're completely shunned or disowned. Um, mm. And it was so refreshing to see your parents just really embracing that, really embracing mm. that and even helping you get married, which is mm. just incredible to see. It's not something that I see in, in our culture whatsoever. So how was how did that how did that happen really <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so yeah it's interesting okay so i'm going to correct you first of all with something you said i'm the first gay asian man that you met um you may have met others they might just not be out or they ah. might not accept to themselves you know so yeah. obviously you know to be gay isn't strictly a, a white thing or a black thing or an asian thing or a tall thing or a short thing or a you know um they, to be, you know, your sexual your sexuality is, in my opinion, and in my uh, understanding of the work I've done, is a uh, something that comes from it's innate, it's within you. It's not it doesn't come from people. It doesn't. Come, it's not taught behavior, etc. So it's it's part of who you are. Mm-hmm. The choice to come out is a choice. The choice to tell people is a choice. But the, there's no choice about being who you are. It's like um, saying. Um, you know, if you're a straight person, you choose to be straight. You don't choose to be straight. You don't choose to be queer, uh, whether that be gay, bi, trans, any, you know, anything kind of those lines. It's just something that you are innate. But a lot of people who go through uh, being gay, it's it's quite traumatic because we live in a world which is very different to who our identity is. It, there's this word called heteronormative. Mm-hmm. So we live in a world which everywhere you look, it's, you know, a man and a woman couple off, generally speaking. And so when you grow up in that, and then you realize you don't fit into that. But to please your parents or to please society, you may need to fit into that. It creates a lot of dissonance. And that can create a lot of mental anxiety, then mental health problems as well. And you come across this a lot. Mm-hmm. And therefore, there's a there's this huge challenge in our community. Mm-hmm. If I'm honest with you, my journey to come to terms with my sexuality bore a lot of that challenge. Um, it wasn't an easy journey. And... Yes, my parents are incredible people, and yes, they've fully accepted who I am now. I'd say fully 99%. I'm sure somewhere in them, <laughs> there's still that little hope that, you know, I'd be a, a straight man marrying a woman, etc. But, uh, you know, they, they've gone through their own journey. And uh, when I first came out to them, it wasn't easy. Hmm. It was very, very difficult because my parents come from a pretty traditional uh, Hindu upbringing. And this was very alien to them. In fact, even though my mother was brought up in the UK primarily, she came here when she was quite young, uh, it was still quite alien to them, the idea that their offspring could be gay. And I realised as time went on, it was less because I was gay. So there's this concept of coming out, which we're all familiar with, or a lot of people are familiar with, that this idea that you come out, you tell people that you are this, you're gay. However, there's a second coming out, which I think a lot of people in my community sometimes don't realize. And that's the coming out of the parents. The parents also have to acknowledge that they have a a gay, queer child of some form, and then tell other people. And that's quite tough, because for us, as, uh, you know, for me as a queer kid, it's my identity. So, you know, it's kind of to an extent, there's less of a choice. I have to be authentic. I have to come out. But when our parents come out, they have to mull mull along a lot more things because they're now mulling along or thinking about, you know, their child and their child's well-being, um, you know, accepting their child. But then also the community, and if you're part of a religious community, that, and if you could be, you might be outcasted by that, and then your family, and then the judgment that comes with all of that. Or you have a gay child, you must have done something wrong. Or you have a gay child, you know, there must be something wrong within your family makeup or there's all of that judgment. And then to be able to be brave as parents, just to, to stand up to that, takes a lot of work. It's not an easy yeah. thing. And I think sometimes uh, in the gay community, uh, we sometimes, especially in the uh, gay community where we come from communities which can be a little bit more homophobic or ignorant around sexuality, you know, this is something that sometimes is ignored. So with my parents, there was a whole journey uh, mm. that we went through. And if you like, do you want me to explain some more about that journey? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask you about that um, anyway. Uh, but mm. before we get into that, I wanted to ask you about your childhood. You know, what was your 
let's get the feel of what was your upbringing like or how how are your parents like how were they with you when you were younger my parents are incredible people yeah. very very incredible people they are first generation economic immigrants so i know they came to this country they worked their backsides off so you know me and my brother could do well in our lives um they sacrificed a lot of things and i recognize that sacrifice and um i honor their sacrifice because it was really hard and in fact i mean this is something interesting maybe it might be another podcast episode you know, the trauma that our parents generation went through from a racism perspective that's never been acknowledged you know it's only now that i'm of age and i think about these things and i speak to my parents that mom dad you, you must have gone through this um you've never taught t- told us about any of this stuff you never taught us any about this stuff but they went through this trauma uh, a lot of our parents generation you know, that, that are first generation immigrants, you know, they came in the 70s and 80s, but it was not a nice time to be brown or black or non-Caucasian, uh, Cauc- uh, yeah, non-Caucasian. So they went through a challenge and yet they shielded us as children from it. So me and my brother, you know, we were very shielded from what my parents went through. So we didn't get any of that generational trauma, you know, from from my uh, parents, from, from that side of things. Had my own stuff, you know, I grew up in the 80s. So, you know, unfortunately it wasn't the best time <laughs> still to be proud um there were definitely challenges there but my mum and dad were amazing they brought us up to be very uh honest open communicative children and uh you know honoring children you know we did we tried to serve the community we tried to do right by um what the values that were put into us one of the values that mum and dad put into to me was you know uh, open and honest communication uh speak to my parents i remember the first time um i had a cigarette Shh. <laughs> uh, you know I, I didn't tell mom and dad straight away but i did tell them about it you know uh, the first time i got a detention from school i could have hidden it but i did tell mom and dad about it and i was surprised i was shocked at how they reacted it wasn't how i thought they'd be acting it's like ah it was very much you know okay let's deal with this you know it's very pragmatic it was very kind and compassionate in, in my how i saw it and i think that might have helped me in ultimately coming out that I knew my parents would ultimately go through the process, you know, or, or help in some sort of way, in whichever way they could, perhaps. Um, you know, then they had, there was another side of things, which I'll explain in a moment. But yeah, my childhood was, childhood specifically was, was, was lovely. The thing that made it really interesting uh, was my dad suffers from bipolar. And so it's a mental health ailment. And uh, at that time, it was undiagnosed. So he used to go through very severe um, mania episodes. And, you know, it, um, it was very, very difficult for us as children to see, and my mother to see, and the family to go through. You know, there was some really, I won't go into it in depth, but, you know, there were, there, you know, there, there were just very traumatic uh, times um, that both myself, my brother and my mother, and some of the extended family went through as well. So um, I did have that to contend with. And I think because of that experience, I found within me as a person, maybe this ties into my coaching. You know, I've got an empathic, compassionate, nurturing nature. I kind of want to help people. Um, and I think some of the challenges I went through there have taught me strength and strength of character and being able to stand on my own feet, et cetera, that I've kind of aided. So a really good childhood. However, um, I think uh, as I, you know, as I grew older, as I become a, li- a little bit aware of my own sexuality, I did start to notice how dismissively or negatively people within my community would speak about sexuality, uh, sp- specifically homosexuality uh, and being gay. And I remember a conversation, I, I was quite young then, but I- it just stuck in my head, this conversation. It was I was with my cousins. And one of my cousins turned around and said, oh, imagine if someone was gay, how disgusting that would be. Imagine if one of the cousins was gay. And I remember as a young man, you know, all the cousins were like, ah, oh, that's disgusting, ah, oh, that's disgusting. And I was, I was quite young, so I was, these are my older cousins. I remember hearing that and being like, oh, gosh, you know, there is this thing being gay and it's disgusting. And then I remember my uh, mum on TV. So I remember whenever, you know, a, a, a scene of a sexual nature would come on TV, it would be the standard, you know, okay, I'm going to go and make the dal, you know, go to the kitchen, you know, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and the channel might be changed kind of thing. But I remember the very first time a gay kiss came on, I think it was on EastEnders, and it was a lesbian kiss actually. 
it was not a mom's going to change the channel and to make the dawn. It was a venomous disgust. Mm. Like, how can they show this on TV? This is disgusting. This should not be shown on TV. So it wasn't a, you know, the usual typical behavior. This was like venom coming out. And I, again, as a young man, I remember seeing this. I remember going to the cinema with my brother. And uh, I think we went to watch the film Troy, if I remember correctly. And there's a gay kiss in that. And my brother turned around and goes, ah, oh, that's disgusting, you know? So I remember seeing all of these things and, and hearing all of these things. And I was just like, hmm, clearly my family is homophobic. Clearly the society around me is homophobic. Clearly my cousins are homophobic. And you know, one of the things I do actually with my clients and one of the exercises we think about is the difference between homophobia and ignorance. Mm. And with ignorance, ignorance is something that you can educate people through. Homophobia is homophobia. Now, there's a distinction between the two. And when I saw this with my parents growing up and my brother, you know, obviously it was traumatic for me. It wasn't a nice experience to go through. But I realized that they would, especially my brother and my cousins, they were doing it to fit in. So my cousin said, uh, it was going to be disgusting to be gay. Now, at that time, especially, because you know, we're talking 80s, maybe uh, early 90s, you know, none of the other cousins had, they might not have agreed with the statement, but they wanted to fit in as well. They, they don't want to stand out. So they're just going to be sheep and follow the crowd and say, oh, uh, isn't it disgusting to be gay? Because when I actually came out, none of my cousins said that. In fact, all of my cousins were so affirming mm -hmm. and so validating and so loving. Mm -hmm. So then what's the difference? How is it they said that at that point? And yet here they're like so affirming, you know? I think the difference then was it was just a thing to say. It was like, you know, when people say, um, oh, that's wicked. Oh, that's wicked. And everyone's just like, oh, that's wicked. Wicked, we now know is a cool word. But once upon a time, it wicked denotes evil, right? Mm. Oh, that's so bad. You know, they used to be saying, that's so bad, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. That is actually bad. In it. But, <laughs> in it. <laughs> but, you know, when we say, ah, so bad, man, it's, it's, you say that kind of thing to fit in. You know, as a youngster, you see your cousins doing it, you see your friends doing it, you want to fit in, so you say that. Isn't it disgusting to be gay? It's a, it's, a, it's a thing you say to fit in, kind of thing. And I heard my cousins say it. My brother reacting that way was the same thing. When he saw it on TV, his mates at school would have said, oh, that's disgusting when the gay kids came about. So then he says it to me. Because when I came out to him, the first thing he turned, well, not the first thing, but after having a bit of a giggle about it all, he goes, I love you, you're my brother. It doesn't change anything. So why did he behave that way? Ignorance, mm. not homophobia, necessarily. Okay, now I, I want to distinguish there are people that are homophobic. Certain cultures have quite venomous homophobia. So it's not about... But what I'm trying to get to is exploring some of that and understanding some of that. And I do this with my clients to navigate the difference. And you know, a number of times it's come about that it's actually ignorance, not homophobia. Sometimes it is homophobia. You know, my mum, it was slightly different, I guess. Um, hers was less um, ignorance and more just, just not understanding this. And her in her innateness, um, she thought this was not right, it, ungodly, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But she was a bit more older, a little bit wiser. Um, and so, it, you know, I'll talk about the coming out process in a bit, but, you know, it, for her, it, that process took a bit longer. But my whole coming out, you know, my whole childhood, sorry, was quite joyous and validating. You know, I had some, you know, my parents were incredible people, you know, a lot of love, a lot of sacrifices, a lot of affirming of us as, as children, you know. Um, and But, you know, we had dad's ch challenges. And then as I grew up and I got older, I saw the that homophobic language being used and banded around, even on the playground and stuff, you know, uh, that's gay kind of mm. stuff, you know, um, was banded around. It's quite interesting because um, what you just said, like how you, there's the, they don't acknowledge the fact that it's, I don't know, it's like fitting in the sheep kind of mentality. It's not just, in like culture in in our cultures like everywhere in the society is like tribal instinct right and okay. it's interesting what you said about your parents face racism you face racism and that is almost like not the similar but similar ex not accepted mm. right of so course. you would automatically think that because they've experienced that that not acceptance they would automatically fight for the minor minorities who don't feel yeah. accepted right 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 interesting you say that, and and I I agree to an extent that there should be an element of that. I mean, like, I mean, you know, the queer community, for example, it has its own battles as well. You know, we still mm. struggle with racism. We still struggle with you know ableism. We still struggle with chauvinism to an extent, you know, in a smaller way, but, you know, it's it's there. You know, we, we sometimes have transphobia and biphobia within the queer community, the queer mm. community that's been subjected to all this, you know, um, homophobia and hatred and you know, the AIDS crisis that we went through in the 80s and how the gay community was, you know, um, vilified in certain ways. Um, you'd expect the gay community to be the most ex- uh, accepting and most, and don't get me wrong, most people are, it, it, I'm not talking majority here, but you still have those problems. You still have people mm. within the queer community that are biphobic or transphobic, or you know they don't um, they don't accept uh, other people or people that are different from them. And it comes from I think it's it's part of the human conditioning that we uh, we associate to those that are more familiar to us. It's just a normal thing. I mean, why at the end of the day, why did the Asian hubs develop, right? Leicester and Bradford and you know areas of London with Asian people because you know you go to an Asian area or people where there's more Asian people than when you settle, because it's more familiar. You get your groceries and you can probably hear the language a bit more and you got, you know, your community there and your mosque there, your temple there, et cetera, because it's more familiar. If you're an Asian person coming to this country for the first time and you middle, settle in the middle of, I don't know, a very, you know, a remote village where most people are, you know, not Asian or not exposed to stuff, it's going to be tougher for you. Mm. It's, a, it's part of our human conditioning, you know, it goes back. So there is a reasoning for it, but that doesn't make it right. Right, mm. and so but then it's about how do we overcome that? How do we fight that? How do we, you know, challenge challenge some of that? Yeah, it's not an aspect of the communication uh, com- community. It's also the aspects of individual being what are they projecting out in the world? Like you know, mm. so you might be that yourself, but you're not accepting it out in the world. So as you're projecting that, it's like no, that's not okay to be bisexual. It's not okay to be trans. It's like yeah, mm. but there is something in internal work, right? You know, so mm. there's internal stuff that you need to work on. But I, you know, it's like, it's like that in, in every, every uh, tribal community, there's always that, um, this is how it is. The other one comes in, no, this is how it is. This is how it is. It's all about the, I guess, does it go down to control? Yeah. To um... Have the majority control of this community? I think it's less control. I mean, there might be for some people it might be control. I think it's more mm. trying to fit in. People mm. just want to fit in. Ultimately, it's just a fit in. People, look, we all seek happiness or contentment or a sense of peace. And you're going to be more at peace when you're more familiar with your environment around you. And that includes the people you're with mm. or the culture you're in. You know, at the end of the day, I notice this within the queer community. A lot of queer commu- a lot of queer people would gravitate more towards queer people. It just naturally happens because there's a sense of familiarity there within the queer community, you know, um, you know, some queer Asians will gravitate more towards other queer Asians, you know, uh, trans people will gravitate more towards trans people because there's a shared understanding, a deeper shared understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it, it's normal as long as we're conscious of it and we're, we understand, we're not, um, what's the word? We don't uh, alienate other people, which is not right. That's not right. Uh, but it's just, it's just part of us. The control thing, some groups have it. That's that's where you get into the realms of politicians and politics and all that kind of good stuff yeah, or bad yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about you coming out. So how what how was that experience? What was what was their reaction? And how were you feeling before you came out? So um how was I how was I feeling at work before I came out? Incredibly nervous because I genuinely had no idea. I genuinely had no idea how they would react. Um, as much as they taught me to be open and honest children, and that's why I came out, uh, I had no ideas. I, I, I actually had a suitcase packed, ready to uh, leave in case, or you know, in case I was thrown out of the house or had to be, you know, they basically said leave because I genuinely had no ideas. You know, um, it was unknown territory for me, especially with the way mum and my brother and other people have reacted. You don't know. The one of the things I talk about when I do uh, coaching with clients, and I run workshops as well. One of the workshops I ran recently was about coming out. Is it's called? It comes from exposure therapy, and this is I call it mini coming outs. Test the waters. So if you're going to be coming out, <coughs> maybe talk about 
something, you know, like uh, something that's come on TV recently, a gay ca- a character that's come out as gay. Just see how people react. A newspaper article when someone is talking about something gay, a gay marriage, for example. Just see how people react. That will start to give you a bit of an inclination of how people are with the idea of, you know, so maybe just say, oh, by the way, my friend just told me that he attended a gay marriage. See how they react. You know, there's that mini coming up, exposure therapy slowly, gradually gets them ready to to things. I didn't know this. <laughs> well, well, I wish I knew this now, but I, I, I wish I knew it then. I didn't know this. So, you know, when I came out, I had no idea how they were going to react other than what I'd heard, right? What I heard them say. So it's a lot of fear. And so um, I told my brother first, and I told my brother intentionally first because I wanted to use him as a litmus test, like a, a test to see how my parents might react. So I told my uh, my brother and he uh, initially he laughed because he didn't get it. And not he didn't get it in the sense of he was just like, well, I've never seen any signs from you at all in any way that you might do this. <clears throat> so I uh, used him as a litmus test. He was okay with it. He laughed for a bit. And then he was just like, are you serious? He calls me Motavai. Motavai means older brother. So um, in Gujarati, I know in, in some of the Asian languages, Motavai means fat. But in Gujarati, it means older. <laughs> just clarifying it. Because my sister in law is Punjabi, and she's like, I can't call you Motabai, because in my head, it just means you're my fat brother. <laughs> so she just calls me Bhaiya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, Motabai is like older brother. How is that? <laughs> in, in Urdu, it's actually Motas in like fat. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know in yeah. a lot of the Asian languages, Motas fat. But in Gujarati, it's, um, it means older. Mm. So, um, so yeah, I told him, and he, uh, he, he just reacted very favorably. He was just like, look, you know, you're my older brother. I love you. Nothing changes, really. Just something I knew about you that I didn't know. Something I now know about you that I didn't know before. Mm-hmm. And thereafter, um, I told my dad. Um, and uh, that was actually not too bad as well. My father, so initially my dad was just like, look, I'm not happy. Um, I actually told him on a car journey. I remember we were driving somewhere. And uh, when the car journey started, uh, dad actually came out with it. He said, so basically my mum... I think had a discussion with my dad and he's just like, look, my, your son's like 26. He's not interested in girls. He doesn't seem to want to get married. You know, you need to have a chat with him kind of thing. So my dad had this chat with me on the car journey. Um, coincidentally, when I was ready to come out. So I, you know, it's very much like I'm ready to come out. And I, I'd been away in India for a month, for a year, come back. I'd been doing charity work out there, came back and I was like, right, this week I'm going to come out to my parents. It's, you know, this is the week I'm going to do it. It was just very close to after coming away from India anyway. So I think my parents missed me probably. So it probably helped <laughs> the process. So um, car journey going along, dad said, son, are you gay? I was just like, oh, I was going to do it on my terms. So in my head, I'm thinking this. I was just like, right. Initially, I was like, no, I'm not gay. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> my dad just gave me like a, a golden ticket, a free pass. Yeah, right. To say it. But, and then I remember driving, as we were driving to this place, I think it was like a B&Q store or something. It was just like a five-minute drive, but I was like, Dad, look, you know, I, I do have feeling towards guys, and I have been with girls, I've seen dated girls, and nothing's happened, and, you know, I think I might be gay. And, you know, by the end of the journey, I was like, yeah, I'm gay, Dad. And so Dad was just like, right, I'm not happy. Uh, and we went inside, did the shop, as if nothing had happened, you know, typical uh, Asian denial. Thing, yeah, <laughs> Asian, I think yeah. many people, actually, in many cultures have this denial. And then, and then we came out, and then actually, Dad, interestingly, was just like, okay, son, look, I want to know something. I still love you. You're still my son. And, uh, you know, your mum is really going to struggle with this. And more than that, the community is going to struggle with this, the, the greater community. Mm. And I was just like, yeah, I get that, Dad. And I told Dad, I was like, don't tell mum. You know, it's my thing to say. I want to tell mum. Let me say it. So um, a week later, it was about a week later, I, I sat mum down and I was just like, look, mum. You know, look, I don't want to get married to a woman. And she just started crying. And she's just like, it's because you're gay, right? I don't know if dad had told mom, maybe, maybe not. But that's what um, she said. And I'm like, yeah, I am, you know. And she was just like, I don't know what done wrong in pregnancy. It's the worst thing that's ever happened. You know, all this kind of, um, you know. And she was, you know, she was upset. She was crying. And I said, like, mom, look, if you ever figure out what you did wrong in pregnancy, let me know. Because there's be there'll be a million and one other mom that will want to buy that formula or that, you know, what not to do to make a son gay. Because there's nothing you did, right? This is uh nature, right? This is natural, this is God given, it's a gift, it's not a it's not a curse or a sin or anything like that, right? This is who I am. 
And, and you know, initially, I just reassured them. I goes, nothing's going to change. There's nothing. So, again, when I, when I uh, do, when I talk about coming out, I said there's two phases uh, to coming out. There's the coming out, sorry, so there's the truth, and then there's a the real truth. And it's like, you know, if you get into a swimming pool, you first dip your toe in, right, just to see what the water's like. And once you dip your toe in, then you throw yourself in. So the first truth is just getting your parents to accept your sexuality. That's it. Mm. Nothing else. Nothing else. Just So I just wanted my mom to know I was gay and that nothing else changes. And nothing else did change. Nothing else changed. And then once they got round to the idea that I'm gay, then I introduced the idea that, well, I'm actually not going to get married to a woman and I'm going to sit down with a guy. And then, or if I've got a partner, I introduce that. Or if I like wearing women's clothes, if I like wearing, you know, whatever, whatever, it does, you know, lipstick, whatever. But the initial phase, which is the one that takes the longest for them to really settle down into, is just the fact that I'm gay. And that's it. Nothing changes. So I, um, I, uh, yeah, it took some time. And, you know, it, it took, I always say my coming out took a year, a whole year. Mm. And in that time, you know, we went to India to get me married to a woman, you know. Um, in that time, we had some incredibly heartbreaking conversations over and over again. I talk about this concept called normalization quite often in my workshops and when I'm coaching clients. And normalization is, imagine you're going on holiday, right? Um, let's say you're going on holiday and you, you think, okay, in a year's time, let's go to Vietnam. Um, do I today say, oh, I'm go- let's go on holiday to Vietnam uh, in a year's time and then never, ever bring up the subject till the day that we fly out and then that day we book, we book tickets? Or do we, in fact, from today, start talking about the holiday and planning the holiday and getting excited about the holiday? And, you know, every time somebody comes on Vietnam, we get excited on the thing. So the idea that the holiday is coming normalizes, it just becomes part and parcel of things. You can't expect to um, just come out and that's it. You've got to do it often. You've got to bring the topic up often. You've got to speak about it often, often, often. Till one day, it will normalize the fact that Yatin is gay. It will just become day to day, as opposed to um, that one time that you mentioned it and never mention it again. You know, like a holiday. You know, you don't you don't just mention it once and that's it. You have got to mention it. You've got to talk about it. Like, holiday is exciting. This is the opposite. <laughs> but, mm. you know... So I, I recognize that. And, um, you know, we went through that process and I would bring up the topic often. And it was not easy. It was like coming out all over again, all over again. But I recognized, for me, what was important was not just that my parents um, accept my sexuality. I wanted them to understand it. With other people, I just, I didn't care. They just need to accept it. And if they didn't accept it, it's their problem. My parents, I, I, it was my own personal choice. I wanted them to understand it as well as accept it because I wanted them to have a really good grasp of what I was about and who I am. So, um, yeah, the whole process took time. I came out often. When we went to India, I remember having a conversation with my parents. I mean, we didn't go to India specifically to get me married, but we were in India for other reasons. And, you know, the idea of getting me married came about. And I was like, look, if this will please you and mom, your mum and dad, fine, I will do it for you guys. But I want you to understand a few things. The first thing is, this is under duress. I don't want this. You think it will make me happy. I can guarantee you this will not make me happy. It's going to be the opposite. Maybe it will even mean at the end of it, I'll end up committing suicide because I'll be that unhappy. But if you guys think so, so be it. But I want to make one thing very clear, and that is when I meet this girl, you know, for the first time, you know, introduce marriages and stuff, I'll tell her that I'm gay. I tell her that I might never have sex with her. We may never be able to have children. This is under duress. That, you know, um, this is something I definitely don't want. But it's coming from my parents. Now, if the girl is okay with that and can 100% wholeheartedly accept that, then fine. You know, I'll, I'll look again. My mum and dad were like, no, 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 no. You can't tell people that. You, know, you can't tell the girl that. I'm like, well, you brought me up to be an honest child. You brought me up to be, you know, wholeheartedly open and honest. Mm. Now, this person who's going to end up potentially being my uh, soulmate or my, you know, my lifetime partner for the rest of my life, you don't think they're going to figure it out? You don't think I owe them the truth from now? Mm. You know, that's just not right otherwise. So <laughs> I remember very quickly my parents were just like, right, we'll forget that idea. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that idea. that's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> um, but yeah, it took it took a, it took a whole year, and oh, wow. um, yeah, by by the time. Um, it was, 
It was a year's time, yeah. By the time they were just like, and, and I knew they were ready because mum and dad were both like, right. Because I made it very clear to them as phases. Do you remember I talked about the phase, phase one, the truth, the phase two, the real truth. Once they kind of got to terms with my sexuality, mm. it was very much like, okay, you, you're gay, we accept that. But, you know, just keep it quiet, keep it on the down low, don't tell anyone. Mm. And I'm like, no, I'm me, right? I'm going to settle down with a guy. I'm going to probably get married. I want, you know, the full, you know, uh, marriage, you know, all, all of that, my cousins there, et cetera, et cetera, all of that kind of stuff, you know? And so then phase two started, the rest of life, you know, the rest of reality, um, till the point where eventually it got to the point where, or they came round enough to the point where um, dad turned around and said, right, fine, we'll tell the cousins, as in he'll tell his siblings, it makes sense to do this now, because they're going to find out at some point anyway, this is going to, and I think dad was also like, there's nothing to hide here what is there to hide ultimately you know okay okay fine you know there'll be some and by that time i'd kind of brief them and help them come to terms with the idea of coming out they're coming out you know mm. what that process was etc etc et so yeah it's like i really admire your bravery and being disciplined enough and just holding your ground ultimately because i do find that many people kind of cave under and and just allow their society or their parents to just dictate whatever the outcome is and you know some people do end up just getting married and they they're not happy in that marriage um what would you say to the the people who are struggling to get past that fa- first phase mm. yeah how can they it's- get past that it's working out what their purpose is in life, right? What is your purpose in life? What is it you want out of your life, right? Maybe your purpose is to serve. And sometimes, you know, through service, we sacrifice. And if people can sacrifice their sexuality, genuinely, so I'm talking genuine. This isn't, this is something you do within the depth of your own heart, privately. You know? If you feel you can genuinely accept that, then fine. You know, to, to being gay or not, be, so. You're a queer person. Being out or not being out doesn't mean life's magically going to be okay. <laughs> You're still going to have lots of other struggles as well. This is just one of the struggles, the struggles around identity. Now, you know, identity is a core part of us. And if we're not living to our authentic or authenticity, it's very much a struggle. But if you're in that position, you're already married. You're already with someone. You know, you've got children. You've got that pressure of peers or family or whatever else. You know, ask yourself, why is it you did this, you know? And if that reason's compelling enough, so be it. But if the reason isn't compelling enough for getting into that, you might want to start looking at, you know, counselling, therapy, et cetera, et cetera, other avenues. So start helping you come to terms with your own sexuality. Um, to, you know, I've, I've had a number of clients actually who have um, come out to their wives and then gone down the routes of divorce and co-parenting children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know of clients who, are not clients, but of people who, haven't done that you know they're still with their uh with their partners unhappily um in their in their relationship because they feel that's the right thing to do and that's fine depends on what you're willing to sacrifice i can guarantee you when you're in trauma it's very difficult to see the bright light at the end of the tunnel very very difficult you know when you're in a dark place so if you're in a relationship that's inauthentic or if you're in a place which is sad or depressed it's very difficult to see the light at the end of the tunnel but there is light (laughs) There is light. There always is light. But the question is, how do you navigate that space? So if you want to, you're going to have to accept you're going to go through a period of trauma and challenge. If you're splitting up with your partner, or your wife specifically, or if you're a lesbian and you're you know, splitting up with your husband and, you know, accepting that, you know, the community will speak and etc. If you can help yourself, align yourself that that's going to happen and be okay with that, and you can be okay with that. I'm not saying you can't. You can definitely be okay with that with help or not without help if you're a very good introspective person you can help yourself go through that process and get out of the other side it might take a year five years 10 years 20 years i'm not there's no time scales for this but you can get out people are always changing life's always changing nothing's constant so this is something that could change but it's if you're ready and willing to now you know, as a coach i can certainly help you with the coaching side of things i couldn't do the therapy and the counseling that's not my that's not my expertise but from the coaching perspective we can certainly be looking at some of this if that's something a line that you want to go down um down the lines of but that's um yeah that would be my 
that'd be my pen, two pennies worth. But get help for sure. You know, mm. you, you know, you, you got professionals out there that can do this. There's um, I think the UK's got a couple of. It's a NAS Project London uh, has a uh, a counselor that specialises in uh, Asian, I think, or people from the global majority therapy and counselling. Uh, and I think LGBT Foundation in Manchester also have uh, queer counsellors. So, mm-hmm. account- uh, sorry, uh, therapists for gay people. Um, mm-hmm. So we, um, you know, in this podcast, we talk, I call, well, we get practitioners in like, you know, who who are specialists in trauma therapy, internal family system, or, you know, that kind of therapy, which is quite on the holistic kind of side. Um, so we one of the things is like fear of abandonment fear of rejection is like in quite a lot of us in our society in general and i guess like sometimes it starts off with your childhood most of the time it starts off with your childhood but in lgbt community it's it's even more it feels like it's even more 10 times more because not only that you might have have a parent or parents who are neglecting and avoidant and so you you have that fear of abandonment fear of rejection but then you come out gay as well which is another blow another trauma to the system to our nervous system how can if how can you move past that how can you because i know we're actively trying to heal our trauma from our childhood but if you got got another one on top of it which is massive mm. how can we move past that yeah yeah, yeah. it's a great question so the first thing i want to reassure everyone that's listening we can move past it, okay um and the reason i say that is there's a really famous quote by henry ford and it's it goes, if you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> mm. And so I first want to start off with a very positive thinking that it's possible. That's that's for sure. If you want to put in the work or not, it's a different thing. But it's definitely possible. It's possible for everyone. So um, it, it comes down to self-reflection, uh, self-affirmations, is in loving oneself, uh, self-compassion, uh, self-love. So it's, it's this idea of, turning our light inwards and helping us to see ourselves from a, a place of abundance, a place of love, a place of gratitude. Because what we tend to do is, uh, let's say externally, someone does something to us that is not favorable, that we don't like, and we inside of ourselves, our heads, start this negative language of, it's because I'm gay, therefore they've done this. It's mm-hmm. because of, you know, uh, it's because I'm brown, they've done this. It's because of, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, I'm not lovable, therefore they've done this. But that's external. Shine the light inside, right? Okay, so this incident happened. Do I still love myself? Am I still a decent person? Yes, I am, you know? Am I still a kind, compar- com- uh, caring, compassionate person? Yes, I am. Am I still wholesome? Am I still lovable? Yes, I am. And if you start to, instead of focus on that, the problem that they did was because of them, you know? The, they did whatever they did to you because of them, not because of you. Yeah, I'm not giving a specific example. I'm just being general here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's because of them, not because of you. So the, to start that healing process is to go within oneself and start loving oneself. And that can start from language. Um, so sometimes the language we use to ourselves is worse than what we would potentially use with our worst enemies. You know, you know, you're walking along and you stub your toe, for example. Listen to what you say within yourself. Ah, oh, you idiot! You know, effing idiot! F this, you know, you, you all, can't you see where you're going? And you always do this kind of thing, you know. And this narrative kind of starts off. You know, when you're a child, you, you envision an incident happened where you did something similar and you berated yourself or someone berated you. And then you know, uh, another incident happens when you're a bit older and you know some other negative thing. And you, you, in the moment. You just have this whole stream of this vileness, this negativity. So there's a concept called inner critic, inner coach. And the inner critic is this what I've just described, this ability just to go within oneself and become really vile to oneself. The inner coach is, imagine you have a friend and they're going through some struggle. What would you say to them? How would you behave with them? How would you, uh, what language would you use with them? 
It'd be quite affirming, right? Mm. It'd be quite helpful. I know you got this, don't worry. You'll get over this. There's no way you're going to fail. I've got you. Don't worry, you're fine. So the inner coach, instead of the inner critic, is using that kind of language. But instead of to a friend, obviously use it to a friend as well, use it to yourself, right? You start to change the language. That you say. Instead of being vile to oneself, change the language. Another, another um, it's slightly different, but within the same spaces, we sometimes quite hard on ourselves. I must do this. I have to do this. I should do this. Uh, if I don't do this, then this is this is what will happen. Think about it. In life, there's always choice. You always have choice within what you do. So instead of using these words like a must and I should, which are quite disempowering, there's something called the Moscow scale. Uh, M O S O C O W. So must M must S should C could W would. So if you notice, the actual order goes, it becomes less and less severe. Must do, mm. uh, have to do, should do, sorry, could do, would do. Mm. So if you remember that in your head, do I have to do this or do I choose to do it? Right? I have to go to the gym. I have to go to the gym. I have to pick up the kids. I have to drink water, right? No, actually you choose to do it. No, there's consequences. Obviously, if you don't go to pick up the kids, the kids might be, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> it's stuck in school as well. <laughs> yeah, but the point is, there's always a choice, and that's the point I'm trying to get to. It's mm. always a choice, and as soon as you bring in words of choice, you choose to do this, um, it becomes empowering rather than disempowering. Mm. This is why I call myself a mindset coach because I, I, you know, these are some of the things that I work on with my clients. So if we start to change the language that we use to ourselves. And we start to use language that's more self-affirming, self-loving, more empowering. Like we would do to a friend who's struggling, inner coach. We start listening to the inner coach. We start to undo the process of trauma that we've had. Now, it's a starting. It's a long journey. Don't, you know, do, you know, there's no quick hacks. I think there's all these you know, people that talk about hack. There's no such thing as a quick hack, mm-hmm. right? There really isn't. It's work. It's deep, introspective, challenging work. But very fruitful. It's a, it's, I've got it's compounding. It, it, it works like compound interest, right? Um, if you put a penny in a bank account, and you have 10%, uh, actually a pound in the bank account, and you have 10% interest um, daily, right? On day two, if you put one pound in the bank account, on day two, you're going to have one pound 10. Woohoo! One pound 10. What can you do with that? Nothing, mm. right? In two days, you'll have uh, whatever that is, you know, a little bit more. I can't remember what the exact calculation is, right? But I think it's like in 30 days or in 50 days, you'll have a million pounds, right? Mm. From compound interest, 10%, 10%, or oh, it's in doubling, I can't remember the exact. The point is, is in the first few weeks, months, years, the effects might not be so tangible. But I can guarantee you over time, your whole mindset changes. It comes from neuroplasticity, it's a buzzword that comes from science. But basically your mindset is changing, neuroplasticity. You're starting to change your mindset. So whereas before you would automatically go to the inner critic whenever something happened, you're now naturally, just without you even knowing it, you're going to the inner, inner coach. And so the next time you stub your toe, instead of going through this real vile diatribe that we go with in our heads, you just be like, oops, I should see that next time. Yeah. And I, I've noticed this within myself once upon a time. I used to do this. <laughs> yeah. I used to be so vile to myself. And now I'm yeah. just like, oh, silly me. I need to watch where I'm going. And then I'm like, oh, my yeah. God, yeah. <laughs> But there's no yeah. vileness. There's nothing vile that's coming within myself. Yeah. So that's the process, I'd say, of starting that process of healing. That, you know, as you say, it's another trauma. You know, we live in a heteronormative world. And if you're a queer child, that's 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 jarring, you know, outside of all the other parental things. It's very jarring. Mm. So it's another thing to work on. It's definitely possible. Remember, if you think you can, you think you can't. You're right. It's definitely possible. Just be patient with the process and don't expect quick hacks. There's no hacks in this. And small things you could do to speed the process up a little, but it's a process you have to go through. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. That that example of a thought you're just like, yeah, I, I joke now. <laughs> like, it's like, hey, oh, that hurt. Great, let's go. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it does. But it's like ultimately self discipline, um, enough to carry it on. Consistency is key as well here, isn't it? Um, to it does it takes a while to rewire your brain in a change of habit form a ha- new habit um 
And yeah, so with in regards to like the the parents, I guess like not not the parents, mm -hmm. even extended family. I feel like you ultimately deep down you get to a point where you just okay with losing people and that's when mm -hmm. you really come out because you don't have that people pleaser you don't have that oh I'm seeking connection validation from you you don't have that anymore because I'm okay losing you mm -hmm. but this is who I am yeah. right if you can get to yourself in that state mm -hmm. it takes a while to get yourself in this state especially when it comes with the family I mean, mm. with friends, it's easier, but mm. with with family, it it takes a while, um, mm. to be in that place. Of like, I'm going to be my authentic self, no matter what you say, when no matter what you do, I'm standing firm in that decision. Yeah, and... it's, a, it's a sorry, go. On. Yeah, no, go. No, I was just going to say it's a very deep sense of acceptance. It's a very deep mm. sense of acceptance because ultimately, if someone has a problem with you, ultimately. It's their problem, not yours. Mm. You know, I think it was the Buddha that said, if someone gives you hot coals, really, really hot coals, and you hold on to them, who gets burnt? Who gets burnt? Mm. Right? Yeah. Let go of that hot coal. Stop getting burnt. Mm. Right? Yeah. So in this kind of instance, once you have that deep sense of self-acceptance, if someone has a challenge, if someone has an issue with you, it's their issue. If, if you make it your issue, oh, it's because I'm gay, oh, it's because I'm tall, oh, it's because I'm black, oh, it's because I'm, you know, becomes your issue it's not yours it's their problem is it this is okay so we're talking if there's someone's giving you feedback out of love that's different that's a mm. very different thing we're talking about non-acceptance we're talking about vileness and this is where we're talking when someone gives you that bat it off but you're, you're right it takes time but there'll come a point yeah where you're okay with people dropping off because it's their issue not yours mm. you're wholesome within yourself they're the ones that can't accept you they're the ones the parents one is the, the toughest one because we're biologically conditioned. It's a biological thing not to, you know, to abandon your parents, especially as humans or as mammals, mammalian, the mammal species, uh, apes more so, primates, you know. It's it's wired into us to to never you know, disconnect that. And especially as humans, you know, we're, out of all the animals, I think we have the longest gestation period, I think it's called, you know. So a mother will look after the child up to the age of seven or eight. You know, you think about a child, until the age of seven, eight, ten, twelve, is 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 dependent on parents. Actually, fifteen, actually, you know, fourteen, fifteen, dependent. You know, a gazelle, once it's born, within twenty minutes, it's up on its feet, running around. An elephant, within you know, thirty, forty minutes, it's trampling along behind, behind its mother. Twenty, thirty minutes. Mm. Human beings, fifteen years, right? So naturally, there's that you know, uh, deep connection. So then, obviously, we want to please our parents. It's built into us, and it's part of that, um, uh, which is our conditioning that we've had as children. So then, once that deep acceptance happens, it becomes their issue, and it is ultimately always been, you know, if I'm a doctor and someone doesn't like doctors, who's got the problem? Mm. I'm a doctor. It's someone who doesn't like doctors who's got the problem. You know, if I'm a teacher and someone doesn't like teachers, who's got the problem? But when it comes to sexuality, we seem to have this strangeness. Oh, no, it's actually a sin and it's this. No. If I'm gay or trans or bi or anything and someone else has an issue, it's their issue, not mine. Mm. The challenge with this, obviously, when it comes to the political forum, because then, you know, if it's a politician that has the issue, we've got to work on that. But um, from, a, from a general society perspective, I know it's their issue, but yeah, you know, that takes time to get to that point. I, I, sometimes it doesn't take time. I'm going to rephrase that. It doesn't take time. It just takes work. The time length, who knows? It takes work. You know? It depends how hard you go out of that work and change things. And I think they ultimately is keep doing the work on you. Ultimately mm, yeah. keep doing the work yeah. on you because you can't change anybody else. You can't change their reaction. It's, it's you. If you work on yourself uh, and be disciplined in it, you can come to a space where you're really peaceful within yourself and you don't really care what other people think and say, even some, some family. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, so if someone is really terrified to come out, you know, just any quick tips that you can give them, what can they do if they're really, really terrified? Um, 
Yeah, so I think, if it, okay, first of all, make sure you're ready to come out. And what I mean by that is you've accepted your own sexuality. That's the first thing. And if you're not sure of your own sexuality or you're still a little bit doubtful, probably not the best thing. You know? Second thing, work out why you're looking at coming out. Um, is it because you just want to be honest or is there some other bigger reason? Um, um, make sure you're in a stable, safe place. And what I mean by that is, let's just say you're looking to come out and things could go wrong. You know, potentially things could go wrong. Have a few things back ready, like a, a backup plan, right, of some form. So um, maybe have um, a few hotels that you've called up to make sure they've got reservations. So if you come out and it goes wrong, you've got something like that. You've got a little snatch bag, like a bag that's packed with your passports, photo, um, money, some spare clothes, etc. Maybe have a you know an auntie or an uncle or an ally, a friend, a cousin that that they know that you're coming out this day. So if things do go the wrong way, you know. It's, and coordinate a phone call with them so you know in, in you know i'll be calling you at 3 p.m today and i would that's after i would have come out so that if the phone call doesn't happen you've given them a list of things to do maybe call the police maybe come over and knock maybe whatever um if you want to if you just think your parents might react a bit funny they're not going to be crazy but they're just going to react a bit funny do it in a public place mm-hmm. um you know go to a cafe or go to a restaurant and or um have someone at home instead have a neighbor or someone come over that you know is gay friendly or you know uh, an ally or part of your chosen family have them over as well so but yeah first thing is make sure you're ready um and then question what your reasonings are if you're you know, again i'm not being dismissive at all but let's say you're a you know 14 or 15 year old kid uh, and you're living under your parents roof and you think you're going to be thrown out if you if you come out do you really need to come out at this stage mm-hmm. live your life you know do you really want to tell your parents if you had a girlfriend if you were straight probably not so live your life it's okay you know um but get yourself to a position where you can you've got a bit of money behind you you've got you know then come out um if again i'm not being dismissive you know your own journeys there's no rights and wrongs in this but uh you know, be safe that's the main thing that's like this it's important mm-hmm. oh that's some great tips as well and also um uh, even you can let in the you can work with um like social workers as well at the at the mm. same time you can even get yeah. in touch with them um yeah, yeah. and they they There's lots let of charity them know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah um so okay so let's talk about relationships right mm. um and on your instagram page is all about relationships you and nigel and it's, it's it's really beautiful so we often kind of get into the like trauma bonded toxic relationship um what is your version of a healthy gay relationship? So a healthy gay relationship involves open and honest communication. So, and I'll be honest, I'm going to drop the word gay here because <laughs> it actually it's just a healthy relationship. Yeah. The, the, the difference between a gay relationship and a, and a, and a, and a non-gay or a straight relationship is nothing. It's actually yeah. nothing yeah. from a relationship <laughs> perspective. Yeah. Two people, do you know what I mean? You might have a man and a woman, man and a man, man and a woman, or a woman who's transitioned to be a man, whatever, right? Um, so mm. it's just a healthy relationship. And I think one of the most important things is open and honest communication. Mm. Being able to talk through anything, all thoughts that go through your mind to your other half. That takes work, takes time, takes effort, takes energy, uh, takes a lot of... Uh, um, uh, vulnerability yeah, to be able to talk in that way so that's one thing mm-hmm. and the second thing i'd add to that is also know your purpose why are you in this relationship what is it you want out of this relationship so you know if you came to nigel and i and asked us why are you together we could say you know we're here to serve um our family is a really big part of who we are we're here to grow and inspire each other we want to make sure we hold each other to account you know so that we don't slip off whatever things that we're doing but that's our purpose of being together. But find out, work out what the purpose is of your relationship. It's really important. Because if you if the purpose of your relationship, and I'm sorry if this sounds a bit harsh, but if it's just um, to feel loved or to be happy, I guarantee you that relationship will fail. Mm-hmm. You can't have a relationship where you're always happy. Are we always happy within ourselves? No. Mm-hmm. So how can we expect someone else to make us happy? It's not going to happen. Or if it's about love, as in the feeling of love, the feeling of love will come and go. It, it wanes and swings, you know, sometimes a bit less, sometimes a bit more. And so on a day that it might be feeling a bit less, if if on that moment you're like, okay, this relationship's over, how's that? So if you work out your purpose, why is it that you're together? Shared values, common values, you bring them together. That can help in that process, very much so. So, and, and that's for um, 
any relationship. Yeah, it <laughs> is. Know, it any is. Relationship. Also, I think I find that working for me personally, you can't build a relationship if the other person doesn't want to do the work that yeah. you're doing. So yeah. not that you're doing, but it's like if there is an argument that you're constantly having and one person, right, I'm going to go in and look into my childhood trauma stuff and the other person like, no, I'm all right, but they're filled with it. You kind of hit a wall. So you got to mm. build a relationship with someone who's willing to do the work on themselves and grow as a person, not just mm. for the relationship, but as a person. Because mm. um, the reason I was like, I asked you because the trauma bond relationships are quite um popular these days like there's quite a lot of toxic uh relationships that's flying about right and i'm just thinking like in lgbt scene um can you trauma bond with somebody who had a similar experience where they disowned by their parents they you know when they meet together it's like oh yeah like we have similar things that we've been been through but with that with that being shunned or disowned you come with fear of rejection fear of abandonment now we know that it plays out in our relation intimate relationships so you can easily get trauma bonded because it's familiar it's familiar hell and you can get triggered we're having an argument i'm getting triggered i'm feeling that wound where my parents disowned me the other person feeling their wound and my parents rejected me. So it's going to keep on becoming toxic and toxic and toxic and toxic. Right. Um, mm. And I just feel like the awareness of working on, on ourselves is really, really important. I feel, especially in, in, in LGBT community, I feel like, cause mm. it's, it's, we're really easily trauma bonded um, with similar experiences but that's a wound there. Yeah, yeah. I think um, what's important, coming together because of trauma is fine, as long as you're working on it yourself or mm. yourself. If you yeah. think the other person is going to heal you or that's the wrong reasons. Yeah. So, you know, relationships are internal process as well as an external process. If we're with the other person because we want uh, them to make us happy or we want them to inspire us or grow us without doing it within yourself, Mm. not going to work you, eventually you got, it's going to fail but if you can work on it yourself and you're working on it yourself it's no harm in it just be prepared to have some clashes because you know that you both parties are going through that that challenge um, yeah. yeah oh beautifully put um so let's talk about your authentically queer workshop what's mm. it about yeah so it's the next workshop that i'm going to be running on the 23rd of um I should actually have the date uh, <laughs> up and ha handy. It's on the yeah, it's on the twenty Saturday, the twenty third of um, uh, September. It's between two to four pm UK time, and it's about actually living your queer life. Uh, and um, you could actually drop the word queer from it, and it's about living your authentic life. But you know, I'm, I'm specialising within the queer space, so it's about you know how do you you know, when you're going through challenges, how do you overcome those challenges? You're now out. So I run a workshop around coming out. So this is a series of them. Um, so this is now, you're now out. How do you now navigate spaces? You know, you're now out. You know, how do you navigate your relationship with your parents, the work relationships, friendships? How do you go about curating friendships? How do you make people? How do you be authentically gay? You know, there's lots of gay stereotypes out there. How do you find who you are rather than living up to other stereotypes and becoming depressed or down or you know worried because of that so we're going to be exploring all of these topics and whenever i run workshops i make them very dynamic very fun very engaging so they're quite wholesome uh events and you know off the back of workshops sometimes people become friends because you know it's quite a collaborative experience uh that i tend to do so um <clears throat> yeah so that's kind of a, a gist of the workshop i don't want to give too much away uh but um it's it's all about kind of finding your authenticity and then learning how to live that authenticity in in many ways as well so mm -hmm. uh, it's, it'll be good fun 23rd of september I'll, i may run it again as well so keep best thing to do is keep an eye on my profile my instagram mm -hmm. page um is it sorry so is it the um only you only work with the queer or do you work with other people as well or outside i work with everyone this particular workshop is queer focused right um 
but I will, I do put on and I will put on other workshops as well, uh, uh, more open to other people as well. It's, um, you know, some might be more um, people of color or, you know, global majority people. Uh, some workshops will be just generic uh, ones as well. So, but yeah, so they're, 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 there's all sorts of um, different offerings out there. Oh, beautiful. Wow, what an interview. This is this is amazing. Uh, it's such um thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. I mean, like, you know, it's um one thing I really wanted to do in this podcast is bring everything together, like, you know, any like LGBT from spirituality and, and like things that aren't talked about on the surface a lot, you know. So I really mm -hmm. wanted to bring all of this together before we wrap this up. Right. I want to ask you rapid fire questions. Yeah, sure. Are you ready for it? <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> All right. Okay. What is your definition of universe, God, life? Love. Beautiful. What do you think happens when you die? Reborn. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's like a promotion, isn't it? <laughs> Do you want to come back here and do this again? <laughs> okay, so how do you define religion and spirituality? How do I define, so I define them separately? Yeah, how They're do you define them? Yeah. Okay, spirituality is about growing to be the best version of yourself. Mm. Religion is uh, dogma and doctrine given to us. Or mm -hmm. how to be a good person. Mm -hmm. What's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? I'm still learning it, but patience. Oh, be patient. It's everybody's <laughs> lesson. <laughs> Even when you go on a spiritual path. Have we done that lesson? No, not yet. <laughs> I'm going to come and test you. Um, do you believe that people with horrible beginnings end up creating the best features? No, I don't believe people with horrible beginnings create the best futures. I believe everyone can create the best futures, but people with horrible beginnings definitely can as well. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I am fully in present moment when? I'm living my purpose. Beautiful. Do you believe that there is an end to healing? No. No. I mean, we go back and come back. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> um, the world needs more of what? Love. Beautiful. So if there was a one message that you would like to say to someone, anybody in the LGBT com community or anywhere else who who are going through darkest times and can't see the light at the end, end of the tunnel or even dark night of the soul, what would you say to them? It does get better. Be patient. Be self-caring. Remember we talked about inner critical, inner coach. So listen to the inner coach, but it will get better. Beautiful. How can people contact you? Um, so my Instagram, I think you're going to share my SM details, but um, Instagram is one way uh linkedin is another so uh, instagram for more casual stuff uh, linkedin for or queer stuff linkedin for more corporate uh, executive side of things um and my website as well so you can drop me a message off the back of my website there's a contact me page on that oh brilliant oh thank you so much so much yet i'm gonna see you in two thank days you. time as so i was like yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything and being vulnerable enough to share your story of coming out. And I'm, I really, really hope that this message reaches in far, 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 far away communities as like as much as possible. And even if it changes a perspective of a couple of people would, you know, that would be amazing, you know, thank you thank you for coming thank on. you my dear thank you for hosting as well and great to be on this uh, podcast so thank you as well for doing all this work amazing thank you thank you for listening to this episode i would absolutely love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been you can share your thoughts on my facebook or instagram madia sosen if you would like to listen to this episode 
I am on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many, many more. Just search Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends as that will help me out a lot. Thank you so much once again, and I will see you in the next episode.